Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to True Crime, the podcast that helps you find new, emerging, and undiscovered true crime podcasts. I'm Greg, the host and curator of True Crime. Today's episode is from The Gore Report, a true crime podcast. On The Gore Report, they cover everything from true crime, the paranormal, morbid history, and everything else to make your skin crawl. If you liked today's episode, make sure to check out the episode description for links to subscribe. All right, let's get this show started. Begin. thing that i can promise you about how this case is going to make you feel okay like the one guarantee right by the end of it you're going to fucking hate clowns (laughs) 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 hi everyone my name is gage and i'm ray and you are listening to gore report a true crime podcast yay yay yes sir ray (laughs) spooky spooky So, if you're new here, hi, hello, and welcome. Welcome, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, then double welcome. Welcome. (laughs) (laughs) We are such goblins. (laughs) We quite literally are such goblins. I can't stand it. And I mean that as a synonym for I love it. (laughs) So, you guys, we also hope you're having a good day and a good week. And And a a good good life. life. We are always wishing you that happy, safe, wonderful, loving, pleasant existence. Oh, that's all you have for me today? (laughs) (laughs) You seem so disappointed. You said, where are my 35 plus adjectives? I demand them. Okay, in that case, then I'm going to restart it. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) We hope you're having a happy, lovely, safe, pleasant, bright, warm Not full of anger, sadness, or animosity. Lively kind of existence. (laughs) I had to scan my brain for like two seconds, but then I ran out of adjectives. Goodness gracious. That was good. Was it better? It was better. Was it better? Okay, cool, cool. (laughs) So we've had a pretty chill week this week. Yesterday, though. (laughs) (laughs) I already know what you're going to bring up, and oh my God. It was quite the scene that uh, befell my eyes. Shit. Like you ate shit. I ate shit. Yes, you did. And it's in my brain forever, rent free. (laughs) Okay, so so we had some things that we were going to take to the dump, and we were loading up the back of my dad's truck. And Dalen, my son, and Gage had this love seat. <laughs> and I'm just trying to, I can't really lift heavy things. So I'm just like holding on to the love seat as support and like trying to help you maneuver it. Yeah, because I was standing in the bed of the right. truck. So I ended up walking backwards for a second and my <laughs> foot hit the transmission. <laughs> I started to fall. And as I'm falling, I yelled, Woo! <laughs> And I just, like, rolled backwards in slow motion until I ended up on my shoulder with my feet above my head. (laughs) And the only thing, the only thing that keeps me laughing about it was my (laughs) flip-flop. Fucking flying. My flip-flop. Flew off of my foot as I'm falling backwards, and it went straight up in the air and then landed on top of the transmission. (laughs) Uh, It was so funny. Like, again, I was standing in the bed of the truck, so I just saw this whole travesty (laughs) happen before me, and it was like the look on your face, plus the sound, plus the flying flip-flop. It was honestly just too much. It was so bad. It's been on my mind since it happened. But let me tell you, like, I was laughing so hard 
when it happened that I was like feeling no pain in that moment, but it has definitely caught up to me. So <laughs> if I sound a little low energy, that's why <laughs> I am recovering. Honestly, I don't know if this is going to sound messed up or not now that I think about it, but I'm kind of glad that you're in a state of recovering. Oh God, why? Because <laughs> by the end of this case, you are very much going to be recovering. I think we all are. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. Oh, God. It is bad. So before we jump into all of the bad, I actually do have one little note of good Yay. that I wanted to share with everyone. Give um, it to me. <laughs> it honestly made my day. Like, truly it did. And I know it did for you, too. But we actually got fan mail. Yes. Or I guess I'm going to refer to it as fan mail. But, uh, yeah, we had one of our listeners email us. And uh, I wanted to share it. Because, again, it made my day. So her name's Lynn. And she wrote fan mail, question mark, not sure, <laughs> which I love. Uh, Lynn writes, hello, my name's Lynn. I've been listening to you guys' podcast since it was released on Spotify, and I am a huge fan. First of all, the majority of podcasts I had looked into were not as funny but accurate as Gore Report and hadn't drawn me in as much. I was wondering if you guys do see this. Is an episode on John Wayne Gacy possible? Yes. So thank you, Lynn. That was really awesome that you reached out to us. And you know... I've said it like four times, whatever, but it made my day because at the end of it, we're not an extremely big podcast. Like mm -hmm. we just started this, what, seven, eight months ago? Eight months ago. So we're coming up on a year. We're still fairly small, you know, but what matters to me way more is the fact that we have this little community of weird people that interact with us and you know listen to us and they join in with our episodes it's yes. just we have this little family this little weird family and then you have something like this where someone takes time out of their day like they literally take their precious time just to compose something to send to you to let you know that they love what you're doing and to me that's priceless and that you're on the right track and yeah it's yeah. just it's just really really warm i know that like okay for me when I saw the email, I like cliche movie with screaming and jumping up and down. <laughs> yeah, you because did. Because I was excited. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ray. I have a problem. <laughs> We're such goblins, truly. This is a goblin ran podcast. <laughs> Thus, we have goblin reactions. The email was just really cool. It made our day. And it was also kind of funny, too, because when Lynn sent this in and she asked for an episode on John Wayne Gacy. Yeah. I was already putting this episode together. Like I was already in the throes of my research. I knew this was going to be my next case. So the timing was kind of perfect. It was perfect. Lynn, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to reach out to us. We really appreciate that. And we're happy you enjoy the show. And I hope you enjoy uh, my coverage today. Yes. I'm so excited. Like, not excited as <laughs> usual. The most not excited form of excited. Okay, so I know there's going to be trigger warnings for this one, so lay it on me. Uh, yeah, this definitely. This kind of gives me an insight of what the what the case is going to be. <laughs> right, right, right. So as you've guessed, today we're going to be talking about one of the most deranged, most evil serial killers in American history, the killer clown John Wayne Gacy. Oof. Uh, this man was truly one of the most evil killers that I've ever read about. Like, I'm just being straight up. Um, it, he's nothing short of an absolute fucking monster. I've only seen one movie about Gacy, mm -hmm. but it was so long ago that, like, I don't remember most of it. So it's basically like listening to this case for the first time for me. And that is very unfortunate. I know, <laughs> I know like small, you know, I know about the clown get up and I know about strangulation, right? Mm -hmm. That's okay, definitely so, something that he did. So, yeah, I don't really know a whole lot about this case anymore. Again, it is unfortunate for you. God, Okay. Uh, it's pretty awful. In the six-year span from 1972 to 1978, John Wayne Gacy kidnapped, raped, tortured, and brutally murdered approximately 33 young men and boys. Uh, he was extremely prolific. Ew. 
Gacy was known for performing at parties while dressed as a clown character that he named Pogo. And he also did clown performances at children's hospitals and children's parties, like birthday parties. Ew. During his clown performances, he would do different magic tricks. He would make balloon animals, just all of that kind of stuff. But behind closed doors, John Gacy was using those same magic tricks and the whole clown get up to lure and trap his victims so that he could then brutally assault and kill them. See, this further just solidifies it for me that it could be literally anyone. It can be anyone. 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 And that is so scary. And that is definitely a theme here for this case because uh, it's insane. It truly could be anyone. It's fucking horrific. One example of these tactics... Uh, that John Wayne Gacy would use, like the magic tricks he would use on his victims. Uh, he called one of them the handcuff trick. And basically, he had a pair of handcuffs and he would he would essentially be like, hey, I have these handcuffs. Let me show you a magic trick. Uh, I bet you can't get out of them. Uh. And then once his victims were, you know, cuffed and obviously couldn't get out, then he would uh, attack. One half of me is like, OK, that's that's stupid. You're going to allow someone to put handcuffs on you? Really? Yeah. You're at their mercy. But, like, the other side of me is like, ooh, magic, curiosity. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the scary thing about it, John Gacy was so charming and, you know, everybody loved him. And, again, the people he killed, they were teenage boys. Oh, no. He had the riz. Yeah. No. Like, he definitely did. For sure. When Gacy eventually confessed his murders to detectives, he claimed, quote, there are four people inside of me. Gacy said that there was John the contractor, John the clown, John the politician, and a fourth person that went by Jack. And John Gacy would say that Jack was the homicidal maniac responsible for all of the killings. So was it like a split personality disorder or like borderline personality disorder? I um, mean, that's just something he said. We are going to dive into that when we get to that point way at the end. But uh, I mean, it's just something he said. It's fucking chilling. So Gacy, he buried 27 of his victims in the crawl space area of his house. And, uh, yeah. And then two others under his garage. When he ran out of room, he started disposing of his victims in the Des Plaines River that runs through northern Illinois. Oh, shit. So, yeah, for like the hundredth time, <laughs> this case is just terrible. There are several families that are still very much suffering today as a result of John Gacy and his crimes. There are still victims of John Gacy that are unidentified. And it's incredibly sad. He killed so many people. He destroyed so many families. And I will talk about it more in depth towards the end of the case. But two years ago in 2021, there was actually a breakthrough in this case. One of the unidentified bodies found in Gacy's crawl space was actually identified via DNA testing. And see, like kudos to technological advances, though, because wow. 40, what, what is it, 40 years later? 30, 40 years later? Yeah, I mean, it's a long time. That's amazing. So this kind of thing definitely has been a blessing in the world of forensics and solving crimes like this. But, you know, on the same note, it's also sad. Yeah. It's also very sad. So, again, I'm going to talk about that at the end. But uh, there was a recent, like in the last two and a half years, victim identification. So gotcha. moving forward. Since there is so much information for us to get through, like I, it's a lot. <laughs> it's definitely okay. a lot. I just kind of want to dive right in. And you know the drill. Like you said earlier, I am going to implement multiple trigger warnings for this one. It is not going to be easy to get through. There are going to be some really intense descriptions of sexual assault, necrophilia, rape, and various forms of torture happening to predominantly teenage boys. Oh, Lord. Amongst other awful things. So, yeah. I just wanted that little note here in the beginning because this is about to be some rough shit. It's absolutely one of the worst cases that I've ever covered. Wow. Like, absolutely one of the worst. So if you feel like at any point that this is too much for you, to you listening, then as we always say, even if you can't find it in one of our episodes, if you need to go listen to something a little more lighthearted, then go do that. Right? <laughs> we will not be mad at you. all of our stuff is traumatic. Absolutely. <laughs> I also want to be completely real for a moment. Like, going into this case, I was a bit intimidated by it. Like, if I'm just being honest, there's yeah. so much coverage on Gacy. There's so much information out there. It's just a lot. Right. 
So as far as my research goes, I've used an extremely vast pool of sources for compiling my information. I've done my very best to be as thorough as possible. It's a lot of path to track, but you know, I believe we can get the damn thing done. Hell yeah. So for this episode, part one, we're going to discuss John Gacy's early life, his upbringing into his adulthood, like his early adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to talk about some of his earliest crimes, including some of his first murders. And then next Thursday, when we come back for part two, that will be the conclusion of this case. That's when we're going to go through the rest of the murders, his confession, basically everything leading up to when he was finally executed in 1994, just all of it. We're going to go through Ooh. all of it. Ooh, this is going to be a ride. <laughs> so, guys, I would say, you know, sit back, relax, grab your snacks, but there would be no relaxing today. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, and definitely something to soothe your nerves as well, because uh, I had several anxiety attacks while putting this episode together. Like, no joke, it straight up made me panic. Yay, we're going to hell! Plains, Plains, Illinois, near Chicago, a man who served time in prison for sex crimes was let out. Today, they found the bodies of at least three young boys buried under his house. 29 bodies were eventually found on Gacy's property. His neighbors knew him as Johnny, the life of the party. Gacy showed absolutely no emotion as all the murder counts were read. Gacy is a 36-year-old building contractor who reportedly dressed like a clown to entertain a children's party. Police today found six more bodies under the John Gacy house in Norwood Park Township near Des Plaines, Illinois. John Wayne Gacy was also Pogo the Clown, who loved to make kids laugh. I hope he does get the electric chair. Then it'll make everybody feel better. I'm sure it'll make the other mothers feel better, too. John Wayne Gacy was called the worst of all murderers by the prosecutor, a man responsible for enough misery to last a century. John Wayne Gacy! It's time for you to die! One of John Gacy's neighbors said all of this is like a nightmare, and it will be several years before this neighborhood recovers from that nightmare. John Wayne Gacy was born to his parents, Marion Elaine Robinson and John Stanley Gacy, on March 17, 1942, in Chicago, Illinois. And he was the second oldest of three children. He had one younger sister and one older sister, making John the only boy. And John's father was a World War I veteran that started working as a mechanic after he returned home from war. And his mother was a stay-at-home mom. Okay. I'm going to note here as well, going forward to prevent confusion, I'm going to refer to John's father as John Stanley, like specifically to differentiate the two. Okay. So John Stanley, wow, he was a fucking character <laughs> okay. um, he was an alcoholic and he had an absolutely explosive temper this man was incredibly violent and incredibly abusive towards his family and i mean incredibly oh like God. john stanley was a mean motherfucker truly he was so john was abused severely at the hands of his father for many years this first part of the episode talking about john's childhood and his upbringing uh going into his early life this is going to be the only time in the entire story where you're going to feel real sympathy for him because the things that John went through as a child were not his fault. Not at all. Um, as for all of the absolute evil things that he goes on to do, well, he chose that path. Yeah. But this first bit of story, he had no say so, and it's unreal. Like, it's unreal. So cherish what we bit of sympathy you have now because I promise it's not going to last long. Okay. John and his siblings grew up with their parents in Chicago. And John Stanley, I mean, he was a monster. He was the type of man that would just explode into these blind rages. He would take every single bit of this out on his family. He was violently abusive towards his wife, and he was violently abusive towards his kids, especially John, because John was the only boy. So his father's target was on his back constantly. I hate that. And it was also said that John would often stick up for his sisters and his mother when John Stanley would be, you know, doing his shit. So right. that, of course, made his father want to target him more. And that's really sad to think about. Yeah, unfortunately, abusers will target someone who will stand up for themselves. Right. I mean, it's just fucking sad. Like, going forward, this it's just going to be sad. All of it's sad. God. So growing up, John wasn't the type of kid who wanted to be athletic. He didn't care to play sports or anything like that. 
He didn't like to hunt or fish or camp. He just wasn't that type of kid. He didn't care to do things outdoors. Gotcha. Not only did he not have interest in those types of activities, but John also actually uh, had some health issues that made it hard for him to participate in those kinds of activities. Okay. We find out a little later in John's childhood that he actually had a pretty intense heart problem that impacted him greatly. We'll talk more about that here in a few minutes, but I mean, it's just something to note. John didn't care about the more physically engaging hobbies and his heart condition didn't really encourage him to like try Mm -hmm. these activities, you know? He was getting incredibly fatigued and at a certain point he started experiencing blackouts. Oh. Like going unconscious, blacking out. So... I can say if that were me, that I wouldn't exactly want to play outside much either. Right. Um, I don't know. Getting fatigued and then blacking the fuck out just seems to take the fun out of it to me. That, <laughs> that, could, that could just be me. But It sounds like brachycardia to me. Like, what is that? Um, brachycardia is like basically where your heart beats at a much slower beat per minute. So doctors will actually give you medicine to speed your heart up. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so like it's brachycardia and tachycardia. And one of them means really low and one of them means really high. So, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me because you'll get like the fainting and everything else. Well, that I mean, that's definitely a possibility. A lot of people also speculate that maybe it was an arrhythmia even of a, some sort. Even a mitral valve prolapse would do something like that. So it's hard to. Yeah. So I'm no doctor. I'm I sorry. Don't really I'm nerding know. out for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally good. We welcome the nerding out. But I don't know. We just do know going forward because it wasn't really public information as to what this heart condition was. But But he had a heart problem. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with anything that I just said, like John not wanting to play outdoors and do all of that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with someone not being interested in that. I mean, for God's sakes, I'm the kind of person I can just think about running and bitch, I get winded. (laughs) Like, so I don't really blame John, but to John Stanley, his father, everything was wrong with that. Everything was wrong with John. John Stanley had these beliefs and bullshit ways of thinking that go hand in hand with generationally recycled abuse. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awful. The presence of toxic masculinity is very strong as well in this situation to a point where it's dangerously violent. A lot of that he could have learned in the military as well. You know, if you if you were gay, it was an insult. It was a it was a shocking like, oh, my God, they're gay. I mean, I believe a lot of this, as I said, it's generationally recycled. Yeah. John Stanley's probably acting on how he was raised and how he was brought up. Right. I mean, that's usually what causes that kind of thing. But John Stanley, regardless, he had these insanely skewed beliefs of what he thought masculinity and manhood were supposed to be. And he had these beliefs of how he thought those things should be expressed. Good Lord. And it was bad. And he 100% projected all of this shit onto John in the most horrible of ways. Um, And it's something we see a little too often in the world today, really. I mean, if you think about it. How many cases have me and you covered that start out in a similar fashion to this? Right. You know, it's just one of those and things. And it's, it's really hard to even make the nature versus nurture discussion come back up because it's like when you have so many people who are experiencing this type of abuse, like at what point is it, you know, you get what I'm saying. At what point is it taken into account? Right. Basically. So since John Gacy didn't meet his father's idea of what a man was. His father put him through literal hell for it, and I mean hell. John Stanley saw his son as very weak and very dumb. He also saw John as being too feminine or too feminine acting, which is just fucking absurd. Yeah. But he just didn't like any of this. With how this man treated John, it's literally like John Stanley just absolutely fucking hated his own child. And it's unreal. Like, I've said that a hundred times. I don't care if I'm repeating myself. It's fucking unreal. Yeah, I I don't understand that at all. So at an early age, John started to receive brutal beatings from his father on a pretty regular basis. And I mean, these beatings were insanely violent. John would often be beaten so severely by his father that it would result in him being knocked completely unconscious. And he's a fucking child. Wow. Like, it's like that. So one of the many hellish images in this story is being painted right now. 
John Gacy was just a child getting beat so severely by his grown-ass father that he'd be knocked out cold, and it happened all the time. John would get beaten with things like leather belts, leather straps, paddles, pieces of plank, even broomsticks. There are also reports that tell of how John Stanley would violently beat Marion in front of their children as well. That's it? That's it. Take his ass out to the woodshed. And, <laughs> and deal with him. Right. Um, there's one report where John Stanley literally broke Marion's nose at the dinner table with all of the children watching. God. Uh, yeah, the children were maybe three to four years old at this time. So John Stanley just stands up and he punches Marion as hard as he can in the face for absolutely no reason. And he didn't give a fuck that his children had just seen all of that and are probably more than likely now trying like he just didn't care what a son of a bitch and the violence like the caliber of violence and the caliber of abuse this was very very ongoing in the household like this was something that happened basically daily jeez john's father was not only physically abusive towards him but he was also extremely verbally and mentally abusive to him as well often calling him some pretty awful names as well as a slew of homophobic slurs. John Stanley would constantly tell John that he was a, quote, sissy queer and a, quote, mama's boy, amongst other fucking awful things. You can, you know, let your imagination do the work. Yeah. It's just sad. And all of this that I'm talking about, of course, no shit, had a profoundly negative impact on John and his psyche. Profoundly of negative. Of course. Like, I just... What did he think was going to happen? Woo, like this shit definitely stuck with John, for sure. So early As on... As it would with anybody. Right. So early on in John's life, he developed this very powerful, obsessive desire to please his father, to make his father happy, and to make his father proud of him. But at the same time, John was terrified of his father. Yeah. What I'm describing here is actually a really common phenomenon that you see uh, with survivors of abuse. And you also see it with severely abused and neglected children. You know, like this consuming desire for the approval and love of their abuser. Yeah, because it's like if I can make if I can make you happy, maybe you'll finally love me. Maybe you'll yeah, finally change. Maybe my suffering will stop. Right. And it's just fucking sad. And that's exactly what John was going through. He became very consumed in trying to gain his father's love and his approval. And as I just said, it stuck with him. It all plays a hideously big part in, like, all of this. Okay. So to add to the physical and verbal abuse that John was enduring from his father, he would also claim way later in his life that he was sexually assaulted numerous times throughout his childhood. By him? By various people, not his father, but various people. Oh, man. So the first instance happened in 1946. John was only four years old at this time. He said in his own words that a, quote, mentally challenged 15-year-old girl took him into a secluded field near his house where she would repeatedly molest him. What the f... Yeah. What? It's not easy. Not easy to get through. In 1949, at the age of only seven, John claimed that a friend of his father's also sexually abused him on a number of occasions. This man was a contractor, so basically he would come over to John's house to hang out with his father. He would end up taking John on these truck rides with him around town to have him help on different jobs and different projects. And I even read that they would stop and get ice cream occasionally. But in between these jobs, or whatever they were doing, this man was molesting John. What the f Fuck. John said that there were many occasions in which he would just be sitting in the truck with this man, and then this man would just reach over and start touching and groping um, his genitals. Ew. And according to John, he was also forced to touch this man back in the same manner. And Double that's, ew. Yeah, it's sick as fuck. Again, he's seven or eight years old at this time. Like, what in the fuck? There's a lot of what the fuck in this story. And John never went to anyone about this abuse because he felt as if he couldn't. And I mean, obviously, look at the kind of person his father is. You know, he was terrified of his dad. And knowing what we know about John Stanley, if John would have confided in him about this abuse, more than likely it just would have been another beating for John. Right. John would even say that it got to a point where he would absolutely dread going on these truck rides with this man. And that's just fucking sad. John would state that every time this man would come over to his house that he just had this pit in his stomach because he knew what was going to happen. 
and he knew there was nothing he could do about it. Of course. Like, Jeez. no, yeah, my God, no person, no child especially deserves to go through anything like this. It's really, this case is really hard to grasp in all of its aspects that it's real. There's also another instance that happened in 1949 where John was caught with one of his friends and a girl in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The three of them were caught touching each other without their clothes on, and uh, they were caught by John's dad. Oh, God. Yeah, so this sent John Stanley into a fucking rage, and he brutally beat John for this. Like, brutally. Every beating he had was brutal, but this one was a little more notable. And unfortunately, from John's perspective, like, he is just perpetuating behavior that he's learning because of these people abusing him only to be found by like the one person he's terrified of. And like, then he gets punished for it. Jeez. I mean, I don't know what to make of it. It's just some truly, truly heinous shit. I'm um, not excusing what he was doing. With uh, the of girl, course not. Of course but not. But I mean, again, he's that's also something a that I just noticed. Like, well, he's also a child and yeah. there is nothing that a child can do that grants you to justifiably beat the fuck out of them. You're listening to Gore Report, a true crime podcast on true crime by Indie Drop-In. We're going to take a quick break. And now back to Gore Report, a true crime podcast. Right. So ever. that's ultimately the point that we're making here. So I agree with you. As I said, all of the beatings that John got from his father on a regular basis, they were fucking awful, every single one. And they happened throughout his entire childhood. Like, I mean, all of it. It didn't stop until way later. And it makes me sick to my stomach to think about, if I'm being honest. Right. But moving on, when John was around nine or 10 years old, his family would go on to relocate to a new house. Like, they stayed in the same general area. They just got a new house. So they didn't move far. And this move was pretty hellish for John in a number of ways. It would be around this time that he started gaining a good bit of weight, which would later lead to him being bullied pretty heavily in school. It would also be around this time that that heart condition I mentioned earlier would also come to the forefront. So, you know, we're on that downward decline and it's not going to go up. <laughs> yeah. And then you have the whole... You know, if you were the fat kid at camp or at school, you know, you weren't popular at I all. I mean, kids are you cruel. You were teased and made fun of. And kids geez. are cruel. And that kind of shit still happens today. It's sad. Poor kid. So even after this move, the abuse from John's father continued very much so. I think I've made that very clear. Um, at this new house, John Stanley spent most of his time in the basement when he was home and not working, and he wouldn't let anyone down there for any reason. It was strictly his space. Okay. He made it, yeah, he made it very clear that he didn't want anyone to go down there. If someone needed to get into the basement and John Stanley wasn't home, then they would literally have to wait for him to get there and unlock the door. What the fuck? Right. John Stanley was very much the center of control and power in this household. He's pretty much running things with an iron fist, I guess you could say. And the rest of his family, they weren't even allowed to eat without him. Okay. Like, that's how fucking insane this is. If food was done and John Stanley was down in the basement doing whatever it may be, everyone just had to sit at the table, not touching their food, just waiting for him. Oh my God. Like, the kids couldn't eat, none of that. And if anyone tried to go to the basement door to, like, call for him or to knock or to let him know that dinner was ready he would literally flip his shit come upstairs and then beat the ever-loving shit out of someone usually john but sometimes marion i'm just wow yeah the entire image of the family dynamic is very fucking sad so shortly after john turned 11 years old he started experiencing these random fainting spells the blackout spells he would just be going about his day and he would just randomly black out. Again, he was going unconscious. So John would be hospitalized for these blackouts several times. Like a whole portion of John's childhood was him going back and forth to the hospital for these blackouts. I just had a thought. What if the blackouts, I mean, because when you sustain that type of trauma and you have someone beating on you, like it's going to cause brain damage. Right. I mean, that's very much a possibility. Not only did he have a heart issue that was causing him to black out, but his father's also beating the shit out of him until he blacks out. So, I mean, eventually it was concluded by doctors that John had some type of congenital heart condition. 
again, it's not really public knowledge what this condition was. It's just not out there, or at least I couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. So that's all we know is that he had some form of congenital heart issue, uh, some sort of defect that was causing him to be very fatigued and also causing him to black out. So get this shit. I'm going to just keep painting this really hellish image for everyone. But when John was being hospitalized over and over for these blackout spells, his father was accusing him of faking everything for attention and sympathy. Oh my god, get fucked. Right, so he continued... I'm so sick of him already. Right, he continued to give John hell. And if you remember me saying a bit earlier that John started gaining a bit of weight around this time, well, his dad was also now giving him shit for that. Now he's just not being called homophobic slurs, but now his father is also calling him fat and shaming how he looks, and just all of that amongst other god-awful things that we can only imagine. And he's being accused of faking this heart condition. And he's also still, I'm going to say it again, continuously being beat on a regular basis by his father. Brutally beat. John also started encountering some pretty intense bullying at school as well. I've already mentioned that too. So, you know, he's not doing good. The, all of this is happening at the same time. Hell is pouring in from all sides. I cannot imagine going through any of this. He's an 11-year-old child. Like, it's fucking insane. Yeah, what the hell? So, five or six years into John dealing with these blackout spells, it's actually discovered that he also had a blood clot in his brain. Not surprised there. He eventually did have a procedure to remove the clot, but yeah, that's just something that happened, and his father... Good old John Stanley, again, 101st time, still beating the ever-loving shit out of him, even after, you know, he had a brain operation and he was recovering, he was still getting beat, and that's just sickening. So, as you kind of touched on earlier, no one knows for sure, but there are a lot of people that speculate that John had one or even several head injuries due to his father's beatings which looking at some examples of how violent john stanley was it's not unreasonable to think that i honestly believe that it could be true i mean we don't know right due to the fainting spells and the blood clot found in his brain john would miss an excessive amount of school as a result you know going to the hospitals all the time yeah and as sad as it is it would cause him to drop out before he could get his diploma and surprise that gave John Stanley just another reason to make John's life a living fucking hell. I'm just, I'm I'm so over this guy. Like, I hope that the rest of his life is a living fucking hell. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So I hope you get pineapples shoved up your ass in hell. I love the little Nikki reference. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's one of my favorite movies. It's a whole new meaning to a pineapple party. So yeah, now to do another god-awful refresh. John Gacy's being called horrible homophobic slurs by his father on a daily basis. He's being called fat. He's being demeaned in every way that you can think of. And now to add to all of this, he's being called dumb and he's being called stupid because he couldn't finish school. He's being accused of faking his heart problem. And then the string that ties that bundle of awful shit together is the fact that he's also being beaten all the time. I can't help but remind you of that. It was continuous, like clockwork. And all of this would stay this way until John turned 18 years old. So when John turned 18, his father would help him get a car. John Stanley was very persistent with John that he should get a job and help carry his weight around the house, so to say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he pitches in and he gets this car for John. And this next part will be no surprise. But this whole gesture of John Stanley getting this car for John, it wasn't something done out of kindness. Okay. Not at all. You probably maybe already guessed that already, but this car was just another source of control that John Stanley had over John. If John did anything in any way that lightly displeased his father, then those keys were taken away. Okay, like, can't win for fucking losing right now. Because <laughs> you're like, man, poor guy. Oh, fuck, I don't want to stick up for right. John Wayne Casey. Yeah, I mean, at this part of the story... You know, him being young, he's not the monster yet that he grows to be, you His know, father so created the monster. Well, I guess in right conscious, you know, we can feel bad for this part of his story. Like I said, all of this leading up to when he was living with his dad, being a child, being a teenager, he didn't really have a say so in much. Yeah. So, and that child doesn't exist anymore because when John Wayne Gacy did what he did, that child is just gone. Yeah. He's one so. of the most evil and sadistic fucking monsters that the world had ever seen. Truly. Right. But it's just like fuck man just fuck i'm so tired of this 
curly headed fuck. I'm so <laughs> tired. So going back to that whole car scenario, John Stanley would just take the keys whenever he pleased from John. And when it came that John did get himself a job, there were many occasions where he would almost lose his job due to being late because his dad had taken the car keys from him. And I wouldn't be surprised if John actually did lose a job or two over that kind of thing. Right. So John reached a point where he was finally fed up with the way that his dad was treating him. He finally said, you know what? I can't fucking do this. I can't handle it anymore. So he packed his shit and moved out to Las Vegas to start fresh. At this time, when he moves to Las Vegas, I guess John already had an interest in politics. Mm -hmm. um, but this is when that interest really came out. More specifically, he was interested in working for the Democratic Party. Uh, John actually started doing some work as a precinct chairman for the Democratic Party. So okay. he got really involved in politics. A precinct chairman is also referred to as a precinct captain. And basically what they do is, is they act as a direct link between voters and the political parties during local elections. Mm. That's their role as a representative, and that's what John was doing when he went out to Vegas. And he was really good at it. Uh, something to know about John Wayne Gacy is that he had this natural gift for talking. He was extremely charming. He was really good at talking to people. He came off as very relatable and easygoing. People seemed to really love listening to the things that he had to say. He just... He had this talent for human connection via speaking. He was, again, just incredibly charming. And I mean, it's a shame that he uses this for evil because, you know, going forth, doing what he does, he uses it for evil. But nonetheless, he had that thing. He had that factor. There are many people that believe that if John Gacy had walked a different path in his life, then maybe he would have had a promising career in politics. Ultimately, right. we won't know because he didn't go that way. Yeah. But it just... All of this is a testament of his natural potential right. of what he had. And I also hate this next part. I really hate this whole rest of this story. But if I laugh a little bit going forward at certain parts, it's purely anxiety, anxiety. laughing. Anxiety. Yeah. If you've listened to us for a while, then you know in no way are we laughing at, you know, these stories because they're real. Uh, we're not laughing at any of that. It's just coping with anxiety. So if you hear me like giggling or losing my shit a little bit at certain parts, that's all that that is. But uh, John's dad started giving him hell about the fact that he wanted to be a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> he did not approve at all of John working for the Democratic Party. So this added a lot of fuel to the fire, oh, so to speak. No. John Stanley was just never fucking satisfied with anything that John ever did. Ever. John Stanley, the Republican. Whatever. The, they're, they both fucking suck. <laughs> but it's like, hey, this is what happened. John Stanley was like, oh, actually? <laughs> As if I haven't made your fucking life miserable enough. Um, fuck you for being a Democrat. Now I'm going to pick <laughs> on you for that. There, you can't win for losing. John would take a temporary step back from politics to look for other jobs in Las Vegas because he wanted to please his dad. Uh -huh. When he moved out there, he didn't really have a plan. He didn't have any money saved up. He was kind of surviving any way that he could. So he decided to look for better paying work. And he found a job as an ambulance driver. Okay. He did that for a very short time. And then after that, he would go on to work as an assistant in a mortuary. Okay. John would work at the mortuary for only a few months. And when he was working there, he also kind of lived there. He would sleep at the mortuary most nights on a cot that he would place outside of the embalming room. Oh, could you imagine that? Like, uh, spooky. No. Very spooky. Spooks. And this next part, this is definitely where some fucking weird enters the chat uh, okay. um, laughs nervously but one of the last nights that john gacy was working at this mortuary there are reports that said that he climbed into a casket with the corpse of a teenage boy and he um fondled and held the corpse uh um yeah john gacy did that and it's a little fucking weird. Excuse me, sir. This is a Wendy's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. As we go forward, you're going to see these really fucking demented and strange things start to appear with John. It's going to be introduced slowly. So, you know, that's the first thing. John did that. And then after that experience, he quit working at the mortuary. 
And then at this point, he decided to go back home to Chicago to move back in with his parents. John, I think you should have quit the mortuary before you did that. <laughs> oh, what so the fuck? fuck? It's weird. So he goes back to Chicago, moves back in with his parents, and this is where he would enroll into the Northwestern Business College, and he would graduate from this college in 1963. Okay. Upon graduating, John actually landed a job working for the Nunn Bush Shoe Company. He actually worked for them as a salesman, and John did fantastic with this job. If you remember yeah. those traits that I was talking about, the things that made him a good politician, the gifts he had for speaking. Well, Mr. Captain Riz. Right, Captain Riz. <laughs> um, these things transferred into this kind of work. It made John quite the salesman. He was extremely gifted in business and sales. So he excelled. He gradually climbed the ladder higher and higher in this company until eventually he was offered a management position in Springfield, Illinois. Oh, I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry. This thought is extremely unhinged, so I apologize in advance. We are extremely unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> but you said Springfield, Illinois, and I don't know why, but I was just thinking like John Gacy as The Simpsons. Oh, God. Yeah, I don't know why my brain did that, but you know, there are it the is. Simpsons in Springfield. I believe so. Yeah. Okay, because like I know what the Simpsons are. I've never watched the show, but you know, I just the don't really Simpsons. know. But either way, thinking about Gacy as a Simpson is fucking terrifying, right. and that's a fuck no for me. So, <laughs> continuing on, John accepts this job. He moves out to Springfield, and this is where two big things happen in John's life. Firstly, while managing this shoe store, he would meet a woman named Marilyn Myers. Marilyn would actually go on to marry John nine months later, making her his first wife. This is also the point in time where John joins an organization called the JC's Organization. Okay. This organization was an organization made up of men in the age range of 18 to 40. The goal of this organization was to build and establish management skills. They did different types of, like, job training. The JCs also established a connection for doing different types of community work, community networking, um, stuff like fundraising. Just that kind of stuff. It's a moose lodge. Basic. <laughs> oh, my fucking God. It basically really is. So... If you don't know, me and Ray are from Georgia. I was born here and grew up here. So here in the South, you see a lot of moose lodges. <laughs> so this kind of was like a moose lodge in a way. Like, I don't know. That's kind of funny that you brought that up. It was basically like that. It was a men's club. And just like with the job at the shoe company, John also did pretty well in the JCs. It would be in 1965 that John would actually be awarded the title of Vice President of the JCs in the Springfield Division. Mm -hmm. He also got, in that same year, the title of the third most outstanding JC in the entire state of Illinois. And from what I understand, that's a pretty big deal. Okay. It just sounds like a big deal. It does. So after John and Marilyn got married, the two of them moved out to Waterloo, Iowa. The two of them were freshly hitched. They wanted to pursue better opportunities. And it turns out that Marilyn's family actually owned several Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises in Waterloo. Okay. So when Gacy and Marilyn moved out there, John was actually offered a management position for three of these franchises by Marilyn's family. Oh, he's got the hookup. Right. As I've touched on, you know, John has these really charming gifts for speaking. He's really good with business and sales. So Marilyn's family saw this and they really liked John. So they were like, hey, you know, run these restaurants for us. We think you can do it. We have faith in you. And that's what John did. John and Marilyn moved into a house in Waterloo that was owned by her parents they weren't being asked to pay rent, so they had this really nice opportunity in Waterloo to get their shit together. John got offered to manage these restaurants. They're living rent-free. They had it going on. Nice. And to add to their success, John also started making a name for himself in the Waterloo community. John would actually become heavily involved with the JC organization that was there in Waterloo, and he did exceptionally well there. And when he became involved with the Waterloo branch of the JCs, he started using his talents to do things such as fundraising, event speaking, just stuff like that. John also started focusing on things uh, like tackling the pollution and littering problem within the community. Okay. <laughs> and I really hate that. Like, I hate to crack up when I say that, but it's just one of these things in retrospect 
It's like, John, you're telling me that you give a fuck about pollution and littering. <gasps> oh my god, they just fucking <laughs> got it! But yet you go on to do some of the most absolutely no! evil, evil and heinous shit that I've ever heard about in my life, but you care about pollution and littering. I just light bulb moment. I just fucking got it. <laughs> So that's why I was laughing. It's just one of those things you just, you know, going back, it's like, what the fuck? So no. yeah, it would actually be again in 1967 that John would be given the title of most outstanding JC in the Waterloo branch. So he won this title again. So on a surface level, John really seems to have a good head on his shoulders. But, uh, you know me, I can't let the vibe be too good for long. Oh, None Lord. of this is real. <laughs> it's all <laughs> very much a cover image for the absolute fucking evil that's inside of John Gacy. Oh, way to go, John. We're fucking rooting for you, man. <laughs> right, right. Like, we were rooting for you, John. You fucked it up. You fucked it way up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, continuing on from what I could find, and it's no surprise, but this JC organization, or at least the specific branch of it in Waterloo, they kind of had some shady shit going on. There was a lot of drug use and substance abuse happening behind closed doors, oh, and Lord. John was really involved in it. John actually had a particular role within the JC organization to bring in new members. He had to recruit people, basically. Okay. But John didn't go about this like in a normal way at all he did not go about this in the way that you would think an organization would go about recruiting people uh no he <laughs> went about this in a very different way oh no so basically when john would meet men that he wanted to bring into the jc's he would invite these men to these parties that he would host at various hotels in the area okay john would basically rent out a room or two at a time he would invite these men over and he would also pay for sex workers to join the party. And then he would play stag films and everyone would basically just drink and do drugs and they would have orgies and they would just party. And uh, that was John's way of being like, hey, the JCs, we're really nice. You should come join us. What the fuck? So that's what he was doing. He was partying. I don't, I don't, this is just weird to me, but we've seen to come across this in, in different cases. But it is not normal for someone to watch porn in a group. I mean, it definitely is a concept that's Unless weird you're, to like, me. Unless you're involved in the sexual activities, you know, then that's one thing, I guess, if, if it's all consensual. I mean, but, hey, look, we're, we're not saying that you can't live your life. If porn is a group activity for you, then live your life. But me? That's... I've never had someone approach me and be like... Hey, man, you want to totally get a snack on the couch and chill and watch some porn? Let's snort a line, you know, watch this <laughs> chapter. It's really good. I've never encountered that, so it's a little what? weird. That's what John was doing, and it was also around this time. John started experiencing some confusion in terms of his sexual identity. Okay. He was struggling with the fact that he was attracted to men, but not just men. John was attracted to young boys. Specifically, like, teenage boys. Uh. So, yeah, John was at the very least bisexual, and he's actually claimed that he's bisexual. But more than that, he was a fucking pedophile. Okay. Very much so. These feelings that John was feeling, they made him angry. He wasn't exactly okay with the fact that he had homosexual tendencies. And you think about how he grew up and how his dad constantly called him a sissy or called him a queer. Just right. all of that shit. It was really drilled into John's head that how he feels isn't okay, which you being gay, bisexual, that's fine and dandy. It's the fucking pedophilia, dude. It's the pedophilia that, That's what's for not me. fucking yeah. okay. So regardless, all of this kind of created a dangerously violent riff in John's personality, very much so. Okay. So as we progress, just know it's only going to go further downhill. I'm going to keep telling you guys that. We're slowly approaching the point where... John would enact these uh, fucking awful desires of his for the first time. And then from that point, it only escalates. Oh, boy. So John kind of started carrying this wild partying lifestyle of his back home. Um, he did this for a short time. He actually convinced Marilyn to get into swinging with him. 
Oh, which, no, pineapple parties. Which, you know, again, do what you do. If that's Living like if it's life. consensual and that's your thing, then hell yeah, this is just what John right? was doing. He got Marilyn involved. But the whole thing didn't really last long because Marilyn would actually become pregnant with John's first child. Oh. It would be in February of 1966 that Marilyn would give birth to their son, Michael. And then just a little over a year later, in March of 1967, Marilyn would give birth to their daughter, Christine. So, yeah, Marilyn and John had two children together. And this whole happy family scenario didn't really last long. Surprise. Because, again, we're approaching that first time that John goes to prison for not being able to control his attraction to teenage boys. So it's God. it's going to get uncomfortable, yeah. Uncomfortable, yeah. I hope you like our song. I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point in time, John is still managing these KFC franchises, and it started to be noticed by other people just a little bit mm -hmm. that John was only hiring young teenage boys to work for him at all of these franchises. Oh, God. Like, he would not hire anyone else, Cringe. just teenage boys. Ugh. John also had this very serious thing where he expected all of his employees to refer to him as the colonel. Get the fuck out. I'm being so serious. Like, he made everyone call him that. He was serious about it. And it's a little fucking weird. I just saw that video in my head of the colonel chasing the chicken through the KFC parking lot yelling, get that ass back here, boy. I'm telling you, it's basically <laughs> like that. But anyways, you know, John, he's specifically hiring teenage boys all the time. People start to find it a little odd. John goes even further when he decides to convert his basement into a party space. Oh, no. Yeah. He started following in, in daddy's footsteps. He started inviting these boys that would work for him over to his basement to drink and party. John had a pool table in his basement. Um, he had lots of porn down there. Uh, porn is going to be a reoccurring theme here. Okay. So that was just the thing. He would invite these teenage boys over. He would watch porn with them. He would get them drunk or high. And then when he had these boys inebriated enough, he would proceed to assault them sexually. God damn. So sick shit. And over time, John got more and more confident and blatant with his attacks. So at this point in life, John Wayne Gacy's ego is just bigger than the sky. He has a wife. He has two kids. He's a prominent figure within the community. Everyone knows him. He's successfully managing and operating three KFC franchises. He's Who's just stop him. He's on top of his shit. And it's actually at this point in time, too, that good old John Stanley would actually start to approve of him, which is wild. Okay. Hell froze over. I'm done. So John Stanley is seeing all of this success that John has. He sees that he's married, which means he's more than likely, quote, not gay, which is some stupid shit, but that's how he was thinking. What the hell? He just sees John doing all this positive stuff, so he starts to give his approval a little bit. What we're seeing now, all of this combined was really giving John a big head. He started slowly but surely escalating with his assaults on these teen boys. And it was also said that right before John would commit these assaults, that he would literally tell these boys that he was conducting scientific experiments. And then he would offer to pay them for sex. I cannot. Yeah, he was telling these boys, you know, hey, I'll pay you if you have sex with me. It's all in the name of science. I'm doing an experiment. It's totally not gay. You know, Shit like that. Let's touch tips just a little bit. So John was assaulting these boys regularly at this point. Regularly. God. Ugh. So in August of 1967, John hired a 15-year-old boy named Donald Voorhees to do some jobs for him around his house. Donald's father was also a member of the Waterloo JCs. Okay. So John kind of knew this kid. But anyways, he hires Donald. Donald comes over to his house and does some work. And then John invites him to hang out and party in the basement. Oh, no. John gets Donald to drink and smoke. And then as this pattern of behavior goes, once he was wasted enough, John sexually assaulted Donald in his basement. And Donald didn't say anything about this attack until March of 1968 when he finally told his father what had happened. And this is really sad. Like, one of the many sad things, but Donald was traumatized by this attack. Of course. After the attack, 
His father noticed that he was becoming very depressed and very withdrawn. Yeah. He wasn't hanging out with people or doing the things that he normally did. He was falling apart. And Donald finally reached a point where he couldn't hold it in anymore. And he told his dad everything. He said, uh, you know, John, he raped me. Oh, my God. So remember... Donald's father was also a prominent member of the JCs, just like John, so he knew John. So this made Donald's father's blood fucking boil. He immediately went to the police, and it turns out that at the same time that Donald's father reported what happened to Donald, there was a number of other teenage boys coming forward expressing that they had also been sexually assaulted by John Wayne Gacy. Wow. And it's crazy, too. You think of that note. Donald's father knew John. They were in the JCs together. Yeah. John is so arrogant and so cocky and confident that he just attacks a JC member's son thinking that he can get away with it. Like that is a display of how cocky he is. Right. And that's fucking sad. And it only gets way worse. So John would, of course, deny all of these allegations. He'd even say that the acts were completely consensual, which is wild because at this point, John is 26 years old and these boys are like 14 to 16. Yeah. Like what in the fuck? So when the investigation into what happened to Donald started increasing in intensity, John would go on to hire an 18 year old boy named Russell Schroeder to essentially shut Donald up by beating him. What the fuck? That's how Gacy was going to solve this. Like it's insane. On Tuesday, September 10th, 1968, the Muscatine Journal published an article titled, quote, Man Arrested for Hiring Youth to Give Beating, end quote. And it's basically going over this I'm whole sorry. incident. I'm going to read this article for you guys now, but it reads, quote, John Gacy, 26, of Waterloo, was arrested Monday and charged with hiring an 18-year-old youth to administer a beating to a West Waterloo High School sophomore. Gacy's arrest by the Black Hawk County Sheriff's followed a report by the 16-year-old sophomore last week to police that Russell Schroeder, 18, had been hired to kill him. Deputy Sheriff Robert Aldrich said Gacy allegedly paid the Schroeder youth $10 and promised to pay off a $300 note on Schroeder's car if the 16-year-old were beaten. The younger boy said he was driven to a park near Hudson where a chemical substance was then sprayed into his face. Sheriff Aldrich said Gacy had given Schroeder the spray. Gacy was held in county jail Monday night. So was the intent to kill him? I mean, I don't know specifically. It wouldn't surprise me. But, you know, on a baseline, the intention was to beat Donald so severely that he shut up. Wow. So Russell lured Donald into some woods and he sprayed Donald in the face with pepper spray or some other chemical spray. And then he tried to beat him up. So Donald managed to get away, and he went straight to the police, of course, about the attack. And when Russell was apprehended, he immediately told police that Gacy had hired him to do it. He immediately spilled, and this led to Gacy being arrested for everything. He was taken into custody and charged with sodomy and attempted assault of a minor. Wow. And it would be on November 7th, 1968, that John Gacy would be officially indicted on those charges, and he would be sentenced to then serve 10 years in prison. Now, this next part is enraging as shit. But that 10-year sentence that John Gacy got was not at all what he served. He actually got out much earlier than that. Okay. So basically, while John was in prison, he was a grade A prisoner. He didn't get into any kind of altercations with anyone. He started working as the head cook in the kitchen. He even studied and went on to get his high school diploma as well. So he's just on a roll while he's in prison. He's doing all these great things. Yay. Hopefully you picked up on my sarcasm. Hopefully you picked up on mine. Uh, but these things ultimately would play a part in John getting paroled early. But before he got paroled, two major things happened to John again. Oh, God. The first thing would be that Marilyn served him with a divorce. And okay. I mean, you have to think about how big of a figure John was in the community. Everyone knew him. Everyone knew Marilyn. Yeah. So when John gets arrested for sexually assaulting and sodomizing a teenage boy, it just threw her over the fucking edge. She wanted nothing to do with it. She was done. She wanted out. So she served his ass with papers. Good and for her. Yeah. Their divorce would be finalized on September 18th, 1969. And this whole thing made John fucking furious because even while he's in prison, and this is something important to know about John Wayne Gacy's personality, one of the things that make him so fucking unbelievable. 
but he was upset at Marilyn for this because he saw himself as the victim in the situation. So well, what in the fuck did you think was going to happen? Did we just experience the birth of Ray Squidward? Maybe. Uh huh. Oh, ah, this case is bringing all kind of new things to light, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, yeah, John got so upset at Marilyn and he told Marilyn that he never wanted to see her or his two kids ever again. Like he was pretty much like, you're dead to me. What? Which it's like, John, if you didn't brutally assault teenage boys, you wouldn't be in prison and you wouldn't be dealing with any of this. So like, how are you the victim here? It just goes into something about John Wayne Gacy and the way that he thinks he always paints himself as the victim. He's there's no it's accountability. The way he sees himself. It's he's always the victim of someone else doing something to him versus him being a fucking monster. Right. And you're going to see that over and over. You're listening to Gore Report, a true crime podcast on true crime by Indie Drop In. We're going to take a quick break. And now back to Gore Report, a true crime podcast. So the second big thing to happen Just two years into John's prison sentence, good old John Stanley would actually die from cirrhosis of the liver. I mean, I'm not mad. "Hmm, Great. (laughs) I'm not mad at it. It was on September 27th, 1969 that he passed away. And this had a pretty significant effect on John. Um, If you remember me lightly mentioning it right before all of this happened and John got arrested, his dad was actually starting to seem proud of him for once. So John felt like that he had just started to taste that approval that he's begged for his whole life. And then, you know, boom, it's taken away. And even though John was a model prisoner, he wasn't allowed to go attend his father's funeral. So that also had a pretty negative impact on him. Yeah. It wasn't long after that happened in October of 1971 that John Wayne Gacy would be released from prison. He only served two and a half years of his 10 year sentence. And upon his release, he was given one year of probation. That's disgusting. Fucking insane. So after his release, John moved back home to Chicago to be with his mother. Um, You know, now that John Stanley was dead, she was by herself. Yeah. So John moves in with her. He gets a job as a cook. Um, He does that for a few months. Then he starts working for a local construction firm. And John did really well in both of those jobs. He was actually able to save up a good bit of money. And this led to his mother helping him get his own house. Okay. This new address was 8213 West Somerdale Avenue, located in Norwood Park Township in Cook County, Illinois. That address that I just gave is also the address that will forever live in infamy. It was the house where John Wayne Gacy would commit all of his murders. Oh, God. This move happened in late 1971. Gacy's mother would move with him. It was also later stated by some of John Gacy's neighbors that they would often see John come and go through all hours of the night with different teenage boys. And these neighbors also reported that they would often hear crying and screaming coming from inside Uh, John's house. Oh, God. And it's fucking horrific to think about. It truly is. Not long after moving into this new house, John would go on to give in to his urges yet again. He invited a 16-year-old boy back to his home to get drunk, and when the boy was sufficiently wasted, John tried to rape him. The boy managed to escape, and he went straight to the police, and John would be initially charged again with sexual assault and sodomy. Have we learned nothing so far? Like, that didn't work the last time. The fuck did you think was going to happen this time? I'm telling you, John Gacy was a deranged motherfucker. He really, truly thought he was invincible. But this whole case with this kid fumbled because the boy that John attacked didn't show up in court to testify. Oh, no. So the whole thing was just assumed to be a lie. And John charmed his way out of it and all the charges were dropped and he got away with it. And that's scary as fuck to think about. You know, he just got out of prison eight years early for behaving, basically. He immediately offends again, and he gets away with it because the poor boy he attacked was more than likely terrified to show up in court. But nonetheless, he didn't show up. John didn't get charged. Again, he gets away with it. Wow. This this didn't even violate John's parole, because remember, he's on probation at this this point. This is insanity. So nothing was done. And what we're seeing, again, is John's ego being stroked. He's steadily forming this belief that he can get away with whatever he wants to do. He's seeing that he's not having any consequences. John Gacy is seeing that if he behaves for a bit or if he intimidates his victims enough, that he can just get off the hook. 
And this fuels John to escalate the violence in his attacks. He starts becoming cocky. He starts, again, feeling invincible. And it's fucking scary because that's exactly what's happening. And this all plays a direct part in how John Wayne Gacy slowly gained the confidence to escalate into killing. Yeah. His desires grew more twisted and more twisted. And, you know, he's seeing over and over again. OK, cool. I can just get away with it. Right. All I got to do. I know exactly what to say. You exactly. Know? You're seeing the foundation bricks of something fucking terrible. So now we're about to get into the murders. This is a lot of information to get through. Gacy had a staggering number of victims. There's more information on certain victims and then not as much information on others. And I went with what I could find. So like I said in the beginning, there are unidentified victims of Gacy still. Yeah. Um, there's just a lack of information about a good bit of it. I tried my very best to be as thorough as I could. It It's just a lot. So, you know, moving forward, I wanted to make that note. Right. So John Wayne Gacy would commit his first murder on January 3rd, 1972, when he found a 16-year-old boy named Timothy McCoy sleeping at a bus stop. John was driving around in his truck and he passed this bus stop, saw Timothy sleeping. He decided to hop into action. John approaches Timothy, and he's acting as a concerned parent. Like, he's turning up the charm. He's asking Timothy if he's had anything to eat. He's asking if he had anywhere to stay. Just acting like a good Samaritan. Okay. So after a few minutes of talking with Timothy, John tells him, You know what? You should just come back to my place and stay the night. You can have a warm bed to sleep in. I'll feed you. John even told Timothy, uh, I'll even bring you back to this bus stop in the morning so you can catch your bus. And Timothy agreed to go, not knowing that the very next morning his life would be ended fucking brutally. Wow. John brings Timothy back to his house and they go to sleep. And as for what happened the next morning, I'm actually going to tell you what John said happened himself, like way later when he confessed all of okay. this. So this is what John said happened that morning. He said that he woke up to Timothy standing in his doorway holding a kitchen knife. John said that this made him panic, so he jumped up out of bed, ran and jumped on top of Timothy, taking the knife away from him. Then John said after he got the knife from Timothy that the two started wrestling and throwing each other around. Um, a physical struggle happened, basically. Mm -hmm. John said that it didn't take him long to pin Timothy down to the ground. And when he did, John said that he just brutally stabbed Timothy to death. Oh, my God. John said that after stabbing Timothy, that he walked into the kitchen to wash the knife, and he noticed that eggs and bacon were out on the counter with plates. So John goes, well, fucking whoops, I made a mistake. It seems like the kid was only trying to make me breakfast. That's why he had the knife. Get <laughs> the fuck out of here. That's the story that John would later give police. It wasn't a, oh, my fucking God, I just brutally murdered this kid when he was trying to make me breakfast. What the fuck? It was a, huh, whoopsies. After brutally killing Timothy and washing the knife off in the sink, John said that he returned to Timothy's body and stood over him. And John said that the, quote, gurgling noises that was coming from Timothy's stabbed throat immediately inspired him to start masturbating over Timothy's body. John, oh, my God. Yeah, John said in his own words that this was the absolute best orgasm that he had ever experienced. And he said that this was the moment when he realized that death was the ultimate thrill. It was the ultimate pleasure for him. Wow. After he climaxed, John then put Timothy's body into the crawl space area of his house. Timothy McCoy would be the very first of 29 bodies to be buried in Gacy's crawl space. That is chilling. So after murdering Timothy, John went on with his life as if nothing happened. In the weeks following the murder... John would actually rekindle a relationship with an old friend of his, a woman named Carol Hoff. Uh -huh. Carol was actually a childhood friend of one of John's sisters, and John and Carol had actually gone on a date together when they were teenagers. Mm -hmm. So at this point in the story, Carol got back in touch with John. She had just gotten out of a nasty divorce. She had two kids of her own. She was in a very vulnerable situation. So her and John kind of hit it off, and they started seeing each other regularly. Things very quickly became romantic, and the two entered into a full-blown relationship. Carol would actually go on to be John's second wife. Wow. John Gacy and Carol actually got married officially on July 1st, 1972, and after the wedding, Carol and her two kids moved into John's house with him. Okay. John's mother, Marilyn, moved out when they moved in. So, you know, it's 
it's chilling to think about. Carol and her two kids have now moved into this house with John Wayne Gacy, and they're just living their lives happy. No one other than John knows that at this current point in time, there's the body of a dead 16-year-old boy decaying in the crawl space, like right underneath them. What the fuck? It's fucking chilling. So after marrying Carol, John actually sexually assaulted another teenage boy. In this instance, John pretended to be a police officer and he forced this kid off the side of the street into his car. Then he forced the kid to perform various sex acts on him. Wow. It's insane. This boy also got away, went to the police, and just like last time, John was charged for this crime but then cleared of all charges. The whole case was dropped. What the fuck? Yeah. So this inflates his ego that much more, solidifying for him that he can, in fact, go out and do this deranged shit to people with I no consequences. I have zero words. I have no words. I have none. No words. John Gacy's second murder took place sometime in 1974. The victim is still one that is unfortunately unidentified. But John said that he strangled this boy to death and then put him in his closet for a few days until the smell and, quote, fluid leaking from his nose and mouth made him move the body. John actually buried this boy in the barbecue pit area of his backyard, which is so fucked if you think about it, because, you know, John was a politician. He's in the community. Everybody loves John. He was constantly having these block parties and cookouts and shit at his house all the time. Oh, so my it's like God. he's hosting these parties and these events and these people are eating and barbecuing and partying near the buried corpse of a teenage boy. You just never know. Yeah, it's truly scary. And it's so scary. And I as, don't like it. And as time went on and more bodies started piling into John's crawl space, he was still having these parties. Oh he was God. still having cookouts like all of it with literal piles of dead teenage boys under his house. Through the early 1970s, John Wayne Gacy very much upheld his status in the community. I literally just went on a rant several times about all of it, but he was a politician. He was involved in politics. He was friends with some of the most powerful and influential people in the area. And I mean, he truly established himself as a complete staple in this community. Yeah. Everyone loved John. Everyone loved partying with John, you know, etc., John Gacy had status, he had influence, he had popularity, he had recognition, and therefore he had power. Yeah. It would be during the same time period in the early 1970s that a rather disturbing character would be born. This is when John Gacy started dressing up as a clown character that he named Pogo the Clown. Like he did the whole shebang. The clown costume, he had hats, he would wear clown makeup on his face like the whole nine yards. John started dressing up as Pogo, and he would go do clown performances at, you know, children's birthday parties and events and things like that. Oh, that's so cringy. He even often visited children's hospitals so he could do these clown performances for sick children. In retrospect, considering that he's a viciously homicidal pedophile, it's like fucking twisted, bone-chilling shit. Right. I could not imagine being a child in the hospital during this time. And being able to tell someone later, oh, yeah, hi, by the way, when I was six, John Wayne motherfucking Gacy was a clown at my hospital to make me feel better. Like, what the fuck? Wow. I could not imagine that shit. So John became really enthralled into clowning. He actually had two clown characters. Pogo was his main clown, but he also had Patches the clown. And John was just really into it. It kind of goes hand in hand with what I was saying about this whole spiel of the community loving him. Everyone, you know, loved John. They talked about how great his parties were. He had the politician thing going on. He was this really awesome guy. And now to add to that, he's a clown. Everyone's pretty much, yeah, we love John Gacy. Did you know he was a fucking clown? Like, God. he's a really cool guy. He never sexually assaulted anyone. Boys just claimed that it happened. He never got charged for it. But you know what? He's a cool fucking clown. You should have him perform at your kids' birthday parties. Like, for fuck's sake. God. Uh-uh. Everyone ate it up. John was very well known and praised for his clown performances. And in a somewhat twisted way, the whole clown thing just added that much more positivity to his image at this time. And a random note, too. This is completely random. That I want to throw in real quick to those of you that have listened to us for a while. Uh, you know that my hobby outside of true crime is makeup artistry. 
I'm a makeup artist. I do special effects makeup, gland makeup, just like all of that. I love it. And I actually have more than one really creepy clown makeup look in my portfolio because scary clowns are actually one of my favorite looks to do. I don't know lit. why. Thank you. It's just they're super fun. When it comes to clown makeup that's geared for children, it's taught that your mouth and eye makeup should be composed of like really rounded, soft, blended edges. Okay. You want to go for a rounded shape. You're taught to do this. Because children are not naturally intimidated by soft, round shapes. It's, like, very imperative as a children's clown that your makeup not be scary, you know? Yeah. So it's, like, an area of children's psychology that touches on how children perceive different shapes and react to them. So really pointy, super sharp edges in clown makeup is known to innately cause uneasiness and distrust in children. So that's why you go for that rounded shape. But when John Gacy would do his clown makeup, whether he did it purposefully or not, he used very sharp, very pointed edges, like very exaggerated edges. And I mean, it's fucking scary. Yeah. Because when it comes down to a theory of how you should do your clown makeup in order to not scare the living piss out of toddlers, John Gacy did the exact opposite. And I just had a thought. Kids are also very attracted to balloons, and balloons are obviously like a round shape, mm -hmm. you know? So, like, uh, round, soft edges. Right. Yeah. And it, it's like this whole area, again, of it children's further, psychology. It further corroborates it. Yeah. It's awesome. So, over time, John got more and more involved with this whole clown thing. He was really immersing himself into his clown characters. It would be in 1974 that John decided. That instead of working for a local construction firm as he had been doing, he decided he wanted to start a construction business of his own. So that's what he did. John went on to start his own business called PDM Contractors, which PDM stands for Painting, Decorating, and Maintenance. Okay. And really crazy fun fact for you here. Uh, I know, Ray, you're going to appreciate this, but... PDM Contractors is where Robin Gett mm -hmm. of the Chicago Rippers would later work. Okay, so it's confirmed now because when I covered the Chicago Ripper crew, it was unconfirmed. Yeah, and, this, and the sources that I read, I found more than one that actually did confirm that, that Robin Gett worked for John Wayne Gacy at PDM. If you guys haven't listened to the Chicago Ripper Crew episode, you should totally go check that out. It was our very first episode. And the fact that they both worked together, do you think they ever did anything crime related together? I mean, I don't know, but it's kind of funny that you bring that up. We're not going to really dive into it now, but way later, there's actually a boy that survived being brutally attacked by Gacy. Mm -hmm. And when he told police about the events, he actually recanted that someone was in the room with John when it happened. Oh, my God. So that wasn't proven to be like a major thing. We don't really know, honestly, but that was something that was said. And that's something that is speculated that John Gacy had an accomplice. So it's just I mean, it's weird. What if that accomplice was Robin Gett? Ultimately, we won't know. That won't is, know. oh my God, my Your brain. brain. <laughs> my brain. So John started this PDM business out of his own pocket. He started looking for employees. And just like he did when he managed those KFC franchises, John only hired young teenage boys to work for him. That was his thing completely. Teenage boys in the 14 to 19 age range. John used this business as a way to lure in young boys with work. And he would continue to sexually assault these boys behind closed doors. He was still inviting boys into his basement to party and watch porn, which I will never get over that, but whatever. Right. Uh, he's still doing all of that. And this next chunk of story going through the next couple of murders that he commits, you're going to see very clearly that John is spiraling. He just he becomes more and more unstable uh, and he goes off the fucking rails, basically, because you're seeing, you know, how confident he's becoming and this whole ego inflation for him not being punished. It really, really starts to make him go off the rail. He starts to get a little sloppy. But, you know, you're just going to see that throughout the murders. You're going to see him steadily falling apart. And also, as we go through, pay attention to the dates of the murders. OK, that's all I'm going to leave you with. OK, continuing on back where I left off. John's hiring all these teenage boys to work for him at PDM. He's still very much luring these boys into the house to assault and or murder them. And he's still doing his clown performances and working with politics, just everything. All of this is the whole shebang. So as time goes on, 
John's wife, Carol, starts to get suspicious of John. She's noticing that he's spending all of his time with teenage boys. Mm -hmm. He's also spending all of his time out in the garage, which John wouldn't let anyone go into the garage. He wouldn't let Carol in there. The kids weren't allowed in there. It was off limits completely. And what does that sound like? His dad. His dad, exactly. So Carol is noticing that John is just acting weird. Uh, she also started finding gay porn magazines laying in various places around the house. Oh, Lord. These magazines obviously belong to John. So Carol, she's like, what the fuck is going on? You know, like, what the fuck is this? So she asked John about the magazines. He denied they were his. And then he straight up told Carol, oh, yeah, those magazines, they're not mine. And you know what? Let's just go ahead right now. Let, let's not have sex at all anymore, like ever again. What? Yeah, he dead ass said that to Carol, and it's really hard to wrap your mind around. Like, truly, that's what he said. So we have all of this shit going on. That Carol, poor woman. Carol and John's relationship is very much falling apart at this point. Uh, we're definitely standing at the beginning of the end. But aside from all of what I just said, the gay porn magazines and John spending all of his time with teenage boys, the thing that really starts to make Carol really kind of panicky and suspicious of John is when she starts noticing an extremely foul odor in the house. Okay. A foul odor that seemed to be coming from the crawl space. Uh -huh. This smell was so strong that at one point it almost made the space unlivable. Like, oh my God. you have to think John has Carol living in his house. He has Carol's two kids living in the house. He has a whole ass family living with him and no one can stand this smell. It was even said that a bug problem started in the house as a result of, like, the odor. Uh -huh. Roaches and different bugs started to gather in one of the rooms in the house that sat above the crawl space. Yeah, these are bugs that are responding to the decomposition. They're hungry. Exactly. And, you know, Carol and the kids didn't know that's what it was. So they're just living in this house that's being overpowered by the scent of death. And no one's, you know, happy about it. So when Carol confronts John about the smell, he just tries to brush it off as a pipe drainage issue. Like he was telling her that some pipes had busted underneath the house and that's what was causing the smell. Okay. So John then goes into the crawl space and he fills it with concrete and quicklime to like attempt to hide the scent. Gotcha. A little time after this incident, John would assault a teenage boy named David Edgecombe. David had worked for Gacy for a few months, and then he quit his job all of a sudden to go on vacation, you know, some sort of trip. Mm -hmm. And that's a very teenage thing to do. I mean, yeah. how many teenagers do you know that have just up and quit their jobs randomly? Like, yeah. come on. But when David gets back from this vacation, he's sleeping one night when all of a sudden he's woken up by knocking on his window. And the knocking was John Wayne fucking Gacy. Ew. So David opens up his window and he asked John, you know, what the fuck? <laughs> right. And John asked him if he wanted to go party with him. So I don't know how John convinced David to do it. You know, John's psychopath, charming, highest caliber you can think of. But he convinces David to go. So David goes with John and he brings along his dog. Um, it was a Siberian Husky. Okay. So after David and his dog get into the car with John... John takes them to the Democratic Party headquarters where he offers David $25 if he can drink this big ass thing of whiskey. Oh, yeah. Sick party, bro. Right. <laughs> so David accepts. He tries to drink all of the whiskey and then he passes out. David later said that he blacked out at the headquarters office and then he woke up in John's garage handcuffed. Oh, God. He said that as soon as he came to that, John was on top of him, choking him and screaming, quote, you son of a bitch, I bet you won't ever quit on me again, end quote. What the fuck? It's insane. So David's husky started barking and freaking out. David's freaking out. And then just as quickly as the attack started, it ended. John let go of David and he apologized. And then he drove David and his dog back home like nothing ever happened and let them go. What the fuck? Nothing ever came of that incident. It was never spoken about again. 16-year-old Anthony Antonucci is another one of Gacy's survivors. Anthony was on the wrestling team at his high school. Remember that. And he had accepted a job from Gacy to help clean up the uh, Democratic headquarters precinct building or whatever it is mm -hmm. and while working john kept trying to pressure anthony into having sex with him 
John kept pushing it until Anthony literally had to swing a chair at him to make him stop. Like, wow. Anthony had to flip out in order to get his point across. So when he swings this chair at John, John's like, whoa, whoa, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> He's like, holy fucking shit, dude, I'm joking. I'm not fucking gay. What the wow. fuck, bro? Like, I could not imagine going through any of that. Like, I couldn't. So after this happens, John calms Anthony down, and then he invites Anthony back to his house to just chill and party. Okay. So Anthony accepts. And when they got to the basement of the house, John told Anthony, well, hey, I have these handcuffs, and I have a magic trick to show you. I bet if I put them on you, you won't be able to get out of them. Oh, my God. Okay, first of all, if he does this, he's stupid. Well, wait, because wait. You just you're gonna, went through You have all to this. wait. You have to hear. But Anthony was actually pretty smart. He did agree to put the handcuffs on, but he thought about it. He accepted John's challenge, but he didn't completely snap one of the handcuffs shut. And he hid this from John. Anthony was still very much nervous about the earlier incident, obviously. He wasn't about to trust this man with handcuffs. Okay, good. So Anthony tells John, well, look, I'm handcuffed and I can't get them off. You were right. And as soon as he says that... And without knowing that Anthony wasn't completely handcuffed, John lunges to attack. And this is where Anthony pops his wrist out of the handcuff. He grabs John. They roll around. And then Anthony uses a wrestling move to flip John on his stomach. And when he had John flipped, Anthony put his knee in the middle of his back and handcuffed John. Nice fucking nice like that is so incredibly badass to me like fucking kid, mint kid you just fucking flipped one of america's worst fucking killers wow crazy shit when john sees that he's in a situation he can't get out of he says well damn you're the first person to ever get out of my handcuff trick good job what the fuck so gacy then asked anthony to undo the handcuffs and then he just lets Anthony go. Not a word was spoken about the incident going forward. Whoa. David Cram also survived potentially being murdered by Gacy. David had moved into John's house temporarily. And he's maybe 16 or 17 years old at this time. He's working for John. And one day, David just comes home. And he finds John on the couch, super drunk, and dressed completely as Pogo the Clown. Ew. John then asks David if he could show him the handcuff trick. And David allows John to place the cuffs on him. And as soon as the cuffs were locked, Gacy tried raping David. The details of the whole attack are kind of unclear. But somehow David managed to get out of the handcuffs and he got out of the house like he ran away. And I couldn't imagine that shit. Whoa. David would then move out of Gacy's house days later. So he stayed for a few days after that. Yeah, he stayed for a few days after, and then he got the fuck out of Dodge. So going back to the murders, Gacy's third murder happened in 1975. During this time, Carol had actually gone to stay with John's mom to help her recover from a fall that she had. Mm -hmm. So this left John all alone at the house. So John had an 18-year-old boy working for him at the time named John Butkovich, and John actually called him Little John. And then Little John referred to Gacy as Big John. So we have Big John and Little John. Gotcha. In July of 1975, Gacy and Little John had gotten into some sort of dispute over unpaid wages. Evidently, Little John hadn't been getting paid for the work he was doing. He was starting to get upset about it. He was threatening to quit his job. It just got a little out of hand. Right. So Gacy decided that he was going to kill Little John. He oh, lured- that's, your, that's your fucking solution, John. Yes. He lured Little John to his house under the pretense that they were going to talk and resolve the whole issue. So Little John gets over there, and Gacy asks Little John the second he walks in, Hey, before we talk about everything, can I show you a handcuff trick? Uh. Yeah, he was like, I bet you can't get out of them. Let me, you know, let me show you this trick. So Little John, obviously knowing Gacy, like they had this whole Little John, Big John, he somewhat trusted Gacy, right. and this is fucking sad. So Gacy cuffs him, and then as soon as the cuffs are locked, Gacy brutally raped Little John and then strangled him to death with a rope. After killing Little John, Gacy drives his car to a nearby parking lot like he drives John's, like Little John's car to a nearby parking lot, and he just leaves it there 
with Little John's keys and wallet still in the front seat. Way later, John would give an entirely different version of these events. He would actually claim that Little John had just shown up with some friends to fight him because of the money issue. So John said that he smoked everyone out, drank some beers, he kind of calmed down the situation entirely, and then he said, oh yeah, by the way, after that I just woke up and Little John was dead in front of me, blue in the face with handcuffs still on his wrist. What? Um, it's deranged as fuck. Gacy, again, was not a killer who took accountability for his crimes at all. He adamantly painted himself as a victim to harsh circumstances and other people's wrongdoing rather than seeing the truth of the matter, which is he was just a fucking monster. And you will definitely, again, see this going forward over and over again through these murders. There's no accountability, and it's absolutely fucking mind-bending. John Wayne Gacy is actually quoted as saying, quote, Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I find strangled kids in my house, dead strangled kids, and I have no idea how they got there and I have no idea what happened, end quote. What the fuck? It would be on July 29th, 1975 that John Butkovich's parents would report him as missing. His parents were very suspicious of Gacy from the jump. They immediately thought that he had something to do with little John's disappearance. And this is really sad to think about, but his parents pleaded with the police on a weekly basis to investigate John, but nothing was ever followed up. Wow. It would be almost three years before this family learned the truth. The body of John Butkovich would later be one of the bodies unearthed from Gacy's garage. His body was wrapped in a thick plastic tarp. And that's where I'm going to cut off for part oh one. Oh my God. I was so speechless through a lot of it because I don't know. It's just, I just got wrapped up in the story. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. It's approaching fucking tragedy. Um, it's like I said in the beginning, this case is extremely big. I wanted to be as thorough as possible. So I believe that this is just a good stopping point to kind of, you know, breathe and digest everything. And then next week, when we come back for part two on Thursday, we're going to pick right up where we left off. And we're going to be discussing the rest of Gacy's murders, the insanity of how he got caught, his trial, just, you know, all of it. Um, part two will be the conclusion of this case. So It's a lot, but... You it's know, a lot. I'm I'm with it. I'm right here with you. Like, you said I'm uneasy. I don't exactly like the vibe, but I'm here with you. Right. So, you guys, we hope you enjoyed part one of this case. As I said, part two will release next Thursday. This is just a lot of information. I want to give everybody enough time to really listen and digest because uh, part two is going to be pretty horrific. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess I'm going to close things out now. If you would like to follow me and Ray and all of our weird, well, great news. You could totally do that. You can find us on Facebook at... Gore Report, a true crime podcast. On Instagram. And Gore Report Podcast. And Twitter. And Gore Report. And don't forget, guys, send us an email at gorereportpod at gmail.com. Spooky. Spooky. And, uh, yeah, I'm honestly not looking forward to part two of this. My stomach has been inside my asshole this entire time. I don't like it. And what the <laughs> fuck, John? I was rooting for you, man, and you <laughs> screwed it up. That's all for today, guys. Bye! Bye. Are you afraid? You should be. You should be. I don't know. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In Network. If you would like to nominate a true crime podcast to be featured, just send me a tweet at Indie Drop-In. I'd also love to hear if one of our featured podcasts is now your favorite show. Indie Drop-In survives off ad revenue and listener donations. If you would like to contribute, please consider buying me a coffee. You can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Indie Drop-In. If you look at the very bottom of the episode description, I put a link in there to make it really easy. Indie Drop-In has many other shows that you also might like. Just go to IndieDropIn.com. All right, see you next week.